The concept of a free operating system that is customizable, useful, and has a large amount of applications would, on the surface, appear to be a winner. If that's the case, why aren't consumers switching to Linux in droves? Before we get into the top five reasons consumers turn a blind eye to Linux, let's cover some Linux history. This is by no means a complete history, which we'll discuss more in depth in another video. So Linux is an operating system loosely based on the Unix operating system developed in the 1970s. Unix was the first commercially viable OS to offer multi-threaded and multi-user support. The downside was the cost, the text-based interface, the computer hardware required to run it, and the expertise needed to install and maintain the OS. It was no surprise then that Unix was only purchased by larger companies or universities that could afford the cost and also had a need for multi-user OS. Based on Unix, the Linux kernel began development in the 1990s and had one key difference to all the other operating systems available. It was free. The Linux kernel was added to a project started in the 1980s by Richard Stallman. Known as the GNU project, the purpose was to develop the rest of what would become known as Linux. As with Unix, Linux began with a text-based interface, much like Microsoft DOS of the same time period. DOS was not a multi-user OS and was designed for single-user computers like the IBM PC. Microsoft had yet to release Windows NT at this point, a true multi-threaded and multi-user environment for servers and workstations. Unlike Windows NT with its proprietary license, Linux had a license that allowed anyone to view, copy, and change the source code, provided any changes or alterations to the source code were made available to others developing Linux. This type of license is called the GNU Public License, often referred to as copyleft licensing. Think of it as the exact opposite of copyright products like Mac OS and Windows. Although Linux was much more robust and offered a beautiful multi-user environment, its lack of qualitative graphical user interface, also known as the GUI, was eclipsed by Microsoft Windows and Mac OS from Apple. With the simple graphical interface, Windows and Mac OS quickly took over the desktop OS market. Eventually, Linux matured and was able to infiltrate the server market, crushing the much more expensive Unix as well as Windows Server products. Microsoft was able to eke out a segment of the server market devoted to enterprise-level workstation management, but never was able to beat the price and quality of Linux for server implementations. Linux continues to dominate the server, smartphone, and embedded systems market. We've talked about servers, but smartphones? Yes, because Linux is the basis for Android OS, which is the largest market share of smartphones. Also, Linux-driven are embedded systems. Think of embedded systems as appliances, such as your Nest thermostat, your car's onboard computer, and even your refrigerator. If Linux has all these great features and is free, what's holding it back from becoming the most sought after OS? The first problem is development. Think of development as the process of creating and writing a program that eventually becomes Linux or Windows or Mac OS. There's a big difference between Linux and the others. Linux is developed by a great many coders spread horizontally throughout the computing industry. Many coders work for free, while others work for companies interested in developing Linux for commercial purposes, usually servers. In many cases, the old saying of, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, is very applicable here. Think of Linux development as a flat, horizontal market, like a line of soldiers spread left to right. The right side may have no idea what the left side is doing way down the line. Windows and Mac OS, on the other hand, are developed in a vertical market, meaning that all coding and development takes place in-house 
at Microsoft and Mac OS respectively. For the most part, Microsoft controls the segment of the market for enterprise systems management, while Mac OS satisfies the desires of end users through premium hardware and software. If we use the soldier analogy again, imagine a triangle of soldiers marching with a single clear purpose. Windows and Mac OS are funded by Microsoft and Apple for the sole purpose of generating income from the sale of their OS. Although there is some software and hardware overlap, each has stayed in their lane, meaning they stick with what their corporate missions are and try to be the best provider of their software and hardware and services that they can. The problem of Linux development is exacerbated by the different flavors of Linux known as distributions. Distros, for short. Although coding used in one distro can conceivably be used in another, this is not always the case. Huge amounts of source code are produced along the horizontal development line. And even though available to all, it may never see usage in a different distribution of Linux. Does this mean the way Linux is developed is bad? Absolutely not. Depending on the end use case, like servers, this development method makes for a strong, qualitative, multi-purpose operating system. Up to this point, we've only discussed OS development. There is also a huge wealth of free and open source software applications, often called by its acronym FOSS. Linux applications development is usually concentrated in the top apps for a given app category, such as a video editor. This might not always be the case, however. Take, for example, the Office products category. There are a great variety of Office applications, also called packages in the Linux community, available. Yes, you say, but what about Ubuntu OS? Canonical, its parent company, did a great job of making a Linux OS that's reliable, easy to install, works on most computers, has the support of any Linux distro. Although all of that is true, we still haven't seen Ubuntu take control of the OS market. Why not? To answer that question, we need to talk about the second item on our list, the real reason an OS is developed in the first place. It's common for many to think the OS is a means to an end, but today that just isn't the case. Linux has users. Windows and Mac OS have consumers. While Linux users are willing to experiment, install an OS, troubleshoot, learn a completely new suite of open source apps, and possibly write program code, consumers aren't. Windows and Mac OS consumers use the OS to consume services and well-known applications. The end isn't the OS, it's just the beginning for the consumer. Apple was quick to realize the value of the OS as a tool to create the walled garden concept, which is defined as a space where the consumer feels comfortable and coddled using its apps and services. Even smarter is that Apple offers these apps and services across multiple Apple devices. Get everything you need on your iPhone, MacBook, and Mac desktop. Some examples of brilliantly marketed services our iCloud, Photos, Messages, FaceTime, and of course iTunes. Services like iCloud and Photos offer internet storage that is easily accessed by any Apple device. Messages allow you to see any text message simultaneously on your phone or your iPad. Similarly, FaceTime allows you to receive and make phone calls for both audio and video, depending on what you choose iTunes is a great example of a service and an application. One can play any music on any Apple device after you buy it from iTunes, of course. Yes, you can copy MP3 files to your computer and load them to your phone, but isn't it so much easier to just buy it from iTunes? If you do choose to buy it from the iTunes app, you'll have cloud access to your music on any device. On the other hand, if you manually copy music to your iPhone, You'll also have to do it to your iPad and Mac as well, assuming the music was on your MacBook to begin with. We've talked a great deal about Apple, but while Windows services aren't nearly as complete, they are growing. 
The bottom line is this. Users put OSs on computers, while consumers buy a device such as an iPhone, MacBook, etc. to consume services and be comforted by a familiar, well-developed, slowly changing environment. Now to the third item on our list. Just as with OS development, commercial applications have followed a similar vertical market that the OS has. Don't believe me? Name the most popular Office app for the desktop. I'm betting you said Microsoft Office. The most popular image editor? You most likely said Adobe Photoshop. On almost any Linux video I create, I see the typical comment. I won't switch to Linux until insert app here is available on Linux. The consumer simply doesn't care at all if there's an open source package available like LibreOffice. That's almost as good as Microsoft Office. Keyboard warriors all around the world are typing feverishly to say, yeah, but Android is Linux and there's a ton of open source apps. Be careful here. Free doesn't mean FOSS. There is a fundamental difference. Have a look at the top five free apps for Android at the time of the making of this video. We have Disney+, Plus, Facebook Messenger, Instagram, WhatsApp, and Snapchat. Notice anything interesting about these apps? You guessed it. Each of these apps are closed source, proprietary commercial apps that allow access to the parent company's service. As before, the OS is a means to an end. In particular, providing services to the consumer for a fee. Even Facebook has a fee, which is your personal information on an unbelievable scale. It's important to be clear on just what free means. I don't think I can say it any better than this quote from Wikipedia. With the advent of the free software movement, license schemes were created to give developers more freedom in terms of code sharing, commonly called open source or FOSS, as the English adjective free does not distinguish between free of charge and liberty. The phrases free as in beer and free as in speech were adopted. The bottom line, consumers don't want to have to install applications any more than they want to install an OS. Notice I said applications, a program typically installed on a desktop. Apps on the other hand are programs we install on portable devices like a smartphone or tablet. The difference is very important. Almost Anyone can install an app, while installation of an application requires much more knowledge. How do you install iTunes? How do you install Microsoft Office on a computer? The former is very easy, while the latter is much more complicated. iTunes is installed by default on all Mac devices, while Microsoft Office requires creation of an account, downloading, and installation. To be fair, you still have to create an iTunes account, and the Microsoft Office installer has made getting your productivity applications up and running easier than before. That brings us to the fourth item on our list. Linux is just too complicated for the average user. You can't beat a computer or smartphone with the OS and a suite of basic apps or applications already installed. At the very least, most have an email client, a web browser, a simple word processor, a music player, calendar, alarm clock, photo and camera tools, and the list goes on and on. To be sure, once Linux is installed, it has most of the aforementioned applications already installed, at least to some degree. In order to truly get access to all the applications you may want, it's necessary to install software repositories, which is an internet service where you can get even more programs for Linux. These repositories often include open source, free, and non-free applications. Yes, you can even run proprietary applications on Linux, though not many. Linux sounds great so far. What are the drawbacks? First is installation. Do you want to wipe your computer and have only Linux or have a dual boot environment with Windows and Linux? Although the process has gotten much simpler than before, installation for the average consumer is not such an easy job. 
What about system updates, adding new repositories, and packages? All of these can be a daunting task. Perhaps the biggest problem facing Linux for market acceptance is troubleshooting. Almost always, troubleshooting leads to the command line interface, often called the CLI for short. When something goes wrong, it's not surprising to have to run a variety of complicated commands. The troubleshooting help available may be incomplete or <sighs> not intended for the distro you're using. If the fix is for your distro, you also need to make sure it will work with your particular version. Often the recommended fix can be years old and is very likely unsuitable for a newer version of Linux. The worst case scenario is when you apply the fix and break your Linux installation. In contrast, ask the average consumer what the command line is and what it's used for. From Mac OS to Windows, even Android and iOS, you will rarely, if ever, have a need to use the CLI. This isn't to say there aren't problems with commercially available operating systems or apps, because we all know there is. The other factor we have to consider is the likelihood that users won't feel comfortable trying a FOSS version of an app. We've talked already about the differences between LibreOffice and Microsoft Office. Even though each package performs the same tasks like word processing, spreadsheets, and presentations, how they go about it is very different. For a more advanced user, it may not be too difficult to switch. For the average consumer, it could be a nightmare. Likewise, the OS itself is just as intimidating for even moderately advanced users. I asked three of my friends to log my computer out of Fedora, running the Plasma desktop environment. For those of you who are new to Linux, the Plasma desktop environment is very similar to Windows. One person was able to figure it out within five minutes. Another simply gave up. And the third was confused by the slight difference in wording and placement in the menus. I think we've sufficiently covered how complicated Linux is, although I could go on for quite a while. Let's tackle our last point to cover, which is most consumers simply don't care whether Linux is free and open source software or not. Their primary concern is whether or not it's free. We use the term average consumer a lot through this talk and here it's even more important although some of us know that the OS isn't free it does come with every computer tablet and smartphone we buy doesn't it some consumers will understand that the cost of developing updating and maintaining an OS is really just baked into the cost of the device most however just assume it's free as in beer if you don't think this is the case, imagine selling a smartphone or tablet to someone without any OS. What if you bought a TV for someone for Christmas and after setting it up, they come to discover there's no OS included with the TV? Well, that's not the biggest offense, however. Imagine saying, yes, you need to download or purchase an OS and install it to get your TV to work. That about sums up why Linux will never dominate the OS market. For those of you who love Linux, I know, it's sad. You're not just a consumer, you're a user. You may even have invested time in writing some Libre source code, or tested a beta version of a FOSS application, or even just reported errors to help the open source community make a better product. As a Linux user, you're not satisfied with the status quo. You want to know why an OS works, the way it works, and how you can better use the features and also protect your privacy and security. If you've made it this far through the presentation without commenting on how wrong I am, hopefully I've given you some food for thought. Certainly there are so many facets of Linux and FOSS I haven't covered, such as the BSDs and their use in iOS and Mac OS. We also didn't cover gaming at all, but that's a story for another time. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, and share. If you didn't like the video, dislike, subscribe, and share. In either case, I hope you'll drop me a comment and let me know your opinion. As always, thank you for watching and see you next time on Fast Gadgets. This video was made possible with support from viewers like you. If you find this video useful, consider becoming a patron for as little as a dollar a month 
at patreon.com forward slash fast gadgets. Thank you.